MC here. I am so excited today. I'm going to have my conversation with our mayor of Palm Springs, Jeff Kors. Good friend of mine, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have some time with him and just get to know him a little bit better. And uh, we'll see uh, how that goes. All right. Let's bring him in. There he is. Hey, Jeff. How, how, how are you? you? Good. Do you have a beverage? I do, of course. Oh, what are you drinking? Oh, very nice. Yeah. I love doing my chats with some kind of beverage. You know, uh, green, green, green tea. <laughs> oh, very nice. Good for you. I'm still on the decaf coffee, so. Yeah. Although it is five o'clock somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe if we're on here long enough, we might we might be able to scooch into that. That would be great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. You know, uh, mm -hmm. living in, in the house now, uh, nonstop, 24-7 for a while. Uh, you're able to get out once in a while? You go uh, no, pretty much in 24-7. Yeah. Uh, do everything from home? Yeah, I can do everything from home. I have to go in to sign ordinances and things along those lines. I normally do that when City Hall's closed. Uh, uh, and then, uh, is possible. how is uh, the with the husband 24 seven. Um, you know, that's good. Yeah. We do well, we do well with that. I mean, we do our own thing. We could be home and do our own thing. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. You know, in my days, I mean, often I'm on Zoom from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Oh, um, and you know, you can actually get more done, right? I'm not driving to Riverside for a meeting or Palm Desert for a meeting. Well, and you know, I can see that changing yeah. the face of the way we do things a lot, I think, in the I world. do too. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's interesting when you're in, whether it's a council meeting, you know, where the dais is set up, where you don't really get to see each other's facial expressions or at other bigger meetings, you see everyone's expressions. So you know often what they're thinking. Uh, uh, when someone makes a face when you're saying something, you can say, okay, you didn't agree with that. Why? You know, uh, it's, so it actually, it's been interesting. There are negatives about not having the human interaction and yeah. not seeing people who make public comment. I think, you know, isn't as helpful because I appreciate the eye contact and seeing people's yeah. reactions when they talk to us. So that's a double-edged sword there for yeah, you. Yeah, it is. There are benefits well, and negatives to that. Um, are you doing, and, and I haven't been a part of any of them, are you doing um, like city meetings that way? Are people coming and talking like they do at the? Yeah, so uh, people can do it by phone. Uh, we also set up a really easy way for people to email public comments that get to all of us. And we actually get to read them before the meeting that way which is always helpful in thinking about issues or doing research. But people can call in now, they register, and the city of Clark will call them during public comment. Oh. Uh, and we're getting probably more public comment as a result because people can do it from home. Yeah, they don't have to go and do all right. that. So, well, then you don't have those volatile um, interactions, then do you? Or are they less? They're uh, not physically there. I mean, they're not. They're not physically there. Uh, but, you know, we did a listening session on racism and police issues and discrimination. And we were able to get people who wanted to to be on the Zoom so they, we actually could see them as they spoke. And I do like that better. And we're trying to figure out how we can do that easily for public comment and keep the meeting moving. Right. That was a four hour listening session. So oh. we get 100 people on the Zoom and just they unmuted when they wanted to speak. For their time and i really like that i think when especially people sharing personal stories and things that they experienced to really get to see them and you feel the emotion more than you can on a telephone call for sure yeah. just like this but you know we can we can chat for hours playing words with friends as yeah. we do but it's not the same as seeing you and seeing your smile and getting to chat but you're right but for me to actually have made some time to actually go out and sit with you somewhere which is how i usually have done these right uh, it just this is so much better. I can get I get more of these done. Uh, yeah, of course. You know, uh, and yeah, I so I think it will change how we do yeah. many things, and we're already seeing it. We have friends who are moving to Palm Springs who aren't planning to because they now we're told they can continue to work from home, and yeah. they'd rather be here than in San Francisco or New York. In certain sure. those two cases, I think I think we're going to see a lot of that. I right. uh, I'm currently looking for work, but I would be I would love to work remotely for someone anywhere. So if anyone is hearing that, I'm happy. Yes, they should. They should. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so, you know, you are the mayor, uh, but you've been in Palm Springs uh, politics for how long? I moved here full-time the first time in 2000. Oh, well, uh, no, that's 
tell me about that. So when, when did Palm Springs enter Jeff's life? Oh, it entered my life probably in my 20s. Um, coming, down, coming down here in the 80s with friends, uh, although most of the life was in Cathedral City at that time. As Where'd, far you as that, Where'd you grow up? I grew up in New York, Long Island. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, so when, when did the West Coast even become a glint? Um, law school. So I went to Stanford and uh, so law school got me to California and you know, the people, the climate, the attitude, um, being openly gay in a place that was still a lot of hostility, even San Francisco and discrimination in the you know, mid and late eighties, but way better than a lot of other places for certain. Nice. And so then, uh, so you went to school and then, so when did you decide, hey, I'm going to, I think Palm Springs is a great place to live. You know, in um, 2000, uh, my ex and I decided to get a vacation place here. Uh, my folks lived in Palm Desert, so it was great uh, getting to see them. They were here half the year at the time and became full time. They relocated here from East Coast? Yeah, they sort of split their time for a long time. Um, all three kids ended up in California, so, oh. you know, uh, Grandkids are much more important than the kids, of course. So there's even more reason since uh, my brother started having some, uh, some kids and they're in LA. And uh, so we were renovating a 1950 uh, Cody house. Uh, and my ex, that was one of the things he did. And we were down here about three, three and a half years. And then when I got the offer for Quality California, um, I moved back to San Francisco, but kept part-time place here throughout. And then James and I, my husband, moved back in late 10 full-time, although we were part-time for many years. So you met James there? I met James on a Alaska Airlines flight flying from San Francisco to Palm Springs. We were sitting across the aisle. Um, I had just spoken at a panel on LGBT legislation in California at the Horizons Foundation, which he chaired the board of, but we didn't even get to talk. But when he sat next to me, you know, I realized he was stalking me. And, uh, and you know, there, and who can turn down that? No, kidding. But I mean, he yeah. did tell his friend he was with that he wanted to meet me and it turned out we were aisle to aisle next to each other. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And then it was uh, love at first sight. Uh, it was pretty close to that. I mean, from our first date, it took us six weeks to get a first date, given my schedule at the time. See how busy you are? Um, and, but yeah, that, that night um, pretty much sealed it. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. And so then uh, you, you knew you wanted to live here. I mean, this I always knew I wanted to come back full time. Um, and he, he actually had a condo here that he shared with some friends when we met. I was coming down actually for the Steve Chase. Um, uh, Ron Oden, who was mayor at the time and was uh, vice president of Equality California when I was running it, at the, uh, invited me to come down and join him uh, for that weekend. So I did. And we met on a flight. And due to the pouring rain in San Francisco, we sat for three hours on the tarmac. So we got to talk a lot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would give you some time to do a lot. Yeah. And I always knew I wanted to come back full time. James thought it would be a little break when we both took a break from our jobs in yeah. 10, and then we do something else. Uh, he had no idea what it was like to live here full time, only part time, and he didn't have a sense of the community. And he was like, who am I gonna talk to after you know, a month? And within six weeks, he's like, okay, I'm never leaving. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what, was the, what was your big interest when you guys were first coming here? What did you, what did you do? Because you weren't into the politics then, and uh, I mean, well, you, involved in the city itself. Right, because I wasn't doing politics, you said. Correct. But I was, so I'll share. Okay, what were you doing? Uh, well, I've been doing politics since I was 13, when I first started working on campaigns. So it's in the blood. Uh, it's something I've always been doing. So, and I got involved when I first moved here. There was a new Palm Springs PAC that was really focused on getting more Democrats and more LGBT people elected in Palm Springs. 
if you go back 20 years, that wasn't the case. Ron Oden was the only LGBT person, you know, who had ever been elected, the only African American, um, and I think the only Democrat at the time on council. So times have clearly changed here. Yeah. So I got involved in that and uh, in 2001 joined the board of what was then known as CAPE, the California Alliance for Pride and Equality, which got transitioned after I was hired. Uh, we rebranded as Equality California. And it was just a two person organization with nine board members at the time. Uh, and I held the first fundraiser here. We had Gray Davis, the governor come down. And uh, so I was really involved in politics, but um, I was also taking a little break at first from my legal work. I took a sabbatical from the civil rights law firm I was a partner in. Um, so I swam every day. I went to the gym six days. So you so, working out six days a week? Yeah, I, I actually did a lot of research and realized it was actually New Year's Eve turning into uh, 2001 and just thought time to get in shape, um, you know, taking a break from work. So swimming every day, set up a workout program that was six days a week, started eating incredibly healthy and cooking at home um, and got truly the first time I ever had, you know, an eight pack in my life. Wow. Actually, only time, only time. Um, Great. Three years later, uh, you know, when my job was eight hours a week, somehow that disappeared. Of course. Uh, I mean, uh, but that was my goal for this year before this all hit. And of course, then the gym, I was working out with my trainer and we set a goal to do it again, six pack by 60 kind of thing. And this hit. So doing stuff at home, swimming, but not the same as being able to work out. You That's know, true. It's, it's become a different lifestyle for everybody. Um, it has. Everyone's, you know, uh, eating at home, obviously, much more, or uh, they're uh, take, doing takeout in our town as it is. And there are some restaurants who are open outside, too. But uh, I have found that, you know, I'm cooking much more. So I wanted to hear from you about what is the uh, restaurant and eating situation for you guys during this time? Uh, does one of you cook? Or what, how are you guys handling this? Actually, we're both cooking. I think we've cooked more since March than in 14 years exactly. uh, together. I mean, like really cooked, right? I mean, um, and you and cook together, together? Yeah, occasionally. We usually oh. each do take one thing on, although, you know, if you need help with something, we'll do that. But like cooking a ton of new recipes, you know, we both have been uh, almost entirely vegan uh, this yeah. year. I saw and, that. You know, that's, so we've really been creative and finding really interesting, fun recipes. And it's been great. It's been really great. So you're enjoying that? Yeah, very much. Hmm. Well, that's great. I, I applaud you uh, for doing that. I mean, it's a choice, right? I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I think I'm always going to be a carnivore, whatever you call that. So, um, so uh, we, we like to use the term um, animal killer. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Env environmental ruiner. Yeah, this unhealthy. is unhealthy. No, just kidding. Everyone has to make these choices for themselves. I mean, I've I'm always had, you know, an issue when I think about the way animals are raised to kill yeah. them for food and uh, the environmental impacts of it uh, and their health impacts. So for me, it's sort of all because people always ask me about it. I did it once for about three years, although I ate fish some, you know, during that. Uh, which I'm really trying to avoid um, now. And I loved in the um, Mr. Rogers movie when you know, that issue came up and he said, you know, I just, how can I eat something that has a mother? Uh, you know, I'm not trying to persuade you, maybe a little no, bit. But if I, you know, if I've really analyzed everything, I, I, you know, am I killing potatoes when I have a vodka? I mean, am I- I know they scream. Oh, oh okay. They don't scream. Uh, but I was reading an interesting article about, you know, if you just actually cut a third of your animal-based products, the impact you can have on environment and animals and your health. Um, so, you know, someone wrote a book, be, be Vegan Until Six, right? Like it does, or Meatless Mondays, right? It doesn't have to be all or nothing right. to do more of it. Just do your share of it, yeah. Right, exactly. Well, that's good. I'm now starving for something that's, you know, not right for me, I'm sure. So uh, we, we talked about, you know, your, your, uh, your journey to get to Palm Springs and you're involved in, of course, the, uh, 
wonderful uh, politics of Palm Springs, which I, you know, I applaud anyone who can have the stomach uh, to, to get through some of those, you know, uh, I think horrendous sometimes, you know, uh, approach that sometimes people make about, you know, the decisions you make and, sure. and all of that. Uh, what, um, what keeps you positive amidst all that kind of controversy over anything that happens? How do you, what do you do? I think ultimately you make sure you're available for people. You get their input, you hear them out, you think about issues. Uh, I change my mind sometimes sitting on the dais, right? Someone in the public says something, my colleagues say something, and to ultimately make decisions that you think are best. You know, look, any significant decision, there are going to be people on both sides who feel passionately. Yeah. And I think too often elected officials just avoid those issues, right? Think how many years we avoided as a city addressing vacation rentals, right? You know, and finally, you know, JR said to me, we need to take this on. And we spent, I mean, there were times we went out of town and spent a whole day just brainstorming ideas. And there were people threatening to recall us on both sides. And, but ultimately, and JR said something to me early on after getting elected. He said, just assume you're here for one term. Do what you think is right, and then you can decide later if you want to run. Don't that's let a, if you want to run again. In, and it was great advice. And you know, we went through a lot. That was a big issue, right? People felt really strongly on both sides, and they both had strong positions. So how do you come up with the right policy that works for our city? Yeah. It might not work somewhere else. And we came up with something that no other city has tried, that both sides didn't love, but seventy percent of the voters supported. Right. And other cities are now copying. So I look at it that way. Like, you know, you don't do these jobs for any reason, I hope, other than you want to help people. Yeah. You want to make the city better. You want to help people's lives. So you make the best decisions you can. And sometimes, you know, a year later, you'll find out, okay, that didn't work out as we hoped. And be willing to say, okay, we tried something. It didn't work. Let's try something else. Yeah. Uh, what, where does your passion come from? Uh, for helping others? Where does that come from? You know, I think I've always been interested in, you know, social, social progress and justice. Uh, someone asked me, you know, like, what, what was my early thing that I remember that I got worked up about? Uh, and I remember as a kid, I must have been eight or nine years old, and my parents, you know, were out, and I had, you know, a babysitter there, and I watched this movie called I Want to Live. And Susan Hayward is likely wrongly accused, right, of a, crime, a murder and goes to the death penalty. And I had this just sense of outrage. I remember this a little kid and staying up till my parents got home to talk to them about it. Oh. Um, and I started getting involved in politics. I worked on campaigns starting at 13. And I've always been interested in social justice and, you know, making the world a better place. You know, and I think that's as I look at the city, you know, your, your hope is you leave things better off than you found them, um, right? That's the goal. Yeah. How can you improve things? It's not just to be sitting up there and, you know, oh. it's to actually try and make change. So we've looked, if you look at the last couple of years, the issues we've taken on, um, and we've heard from some elected officials that we shouldn't be taking them on, right? Our job is to fix potholes and pass a budget, as, you know, some would say. And I don't think that's our job. Palm Springs is not you know, any other city, we should be leading. And you know, cities can lead. I mean, I learned that, you know, in the 90s when I came up with the idea for an equal benefits ordinance in San Francisco that said the city wouldn't contract with any entity that didn't give equal benefits to the domestic partners of their employees that they gave to their spouses. And the Chamber of Commerce went against us and the church went against us and it passed, you know, six to five. And all of a sudden the airlines, the car companies, we're changing their policies nationally and internationally because they wanted the business. And you realize one city can make that difference. So let's be bold. Let's do things that are in the best interests of our residents and our businesses so that everyone thrives here and hopefully other people will follow if we lead. And look, if another city does something and it's great and works, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I have no problem copying things that are really good that other cities do. That's how we should do. That's why we have leagues of cities and coalitions of mayors to share ideas. You have to share the best practices and, exactly. and have that work out. What is, yeah, so what's someone asked me today actually, you know, yeah. like 
okay, you should have much bigger bags under your eyes given what's going on and given all the grief from both sides, right? Open everything, close everything. And I'm like, you know, this is a really hard time. Yeah. Right? I mean, you feel it, I feel it. We've talked about it apart from here. And I think more than anything, it's listening and understanding and realizing, look, this is not a short-term hard time. This is gonna be a long time to come out of that. And let's figure out how we can be kind to each other, listen, and come up with the best options we can. Yeah, uh, what, right now, what is, the, what is the biggest challenge you think Palm Springs is facing? You know, I think COVID is a huge issue, right, in Palm Springs. We probably have the most significant percentage budget loss that I'm aware of of any city probably in the state. And, you know, the state has chosen not to fund cities equally even per person, let alone based on the impact. So for us to have to have to make such significant cuts without a current end in sight, you know, at best, we're through the first quarter of next year before things are going to return to any semblance of what they were. And that's if everything goes perfectly on the science side. Um, so given that, you know, how we can help businesses. So I reached out um, to the head of alcohol beverage control through our assembly member, Chad Mays, to really urge them to allow us to expand where alcohol could be served so restaurants could take over sidewalks and parking spots and then reaching out to our restaurants to help them do that. You know, so trying to be creative to help our businesses survive through this. Because look, if the business is closed, people lose their life savings, people don't have jobs. You know, it's very easy for people who aren't worried about their mortgage and have a nice place to live to say, close everything until we have a vaccine. But, you know, I could survive that, but a lot of people can't. And what are the consequences there? More homeless, more bankruptcies, uh, more people not having access to affordable health care and health insurance. You know, there's more domestic violence, mental health issues. You know, there's no good answer here, right? The best we can do is try and learn how to live with the virus and minimize the spread to the best we can. Uh, so that's a challenge. And, you know, we can't do, have more business open than the state allows, but we can do extra requirements, which we've done, to, especially to protect workers, right? People in essential yeah. jobs who, yeah. if you're in a restaurant, you could be exposed to 100 people a day or a supermarket. And we need to be really conscious and appreciate them. I always say, be kind, thank people who are pouring your water, who are bagging your groceries, because they're seeing 100 people a day. Right. They're putting themselves at risk. Like, be considerate and appreciative for them. So we've, we've had some you know, dark, darker days here in the, in the past few months. Uh, where do you, do you see the light anywhere soon? What do you think? Any? Well, you know, some, I, I see the light every day in the generosity that you see in Palm Springs. You know, the people who are shopping for people who don't feel safe going to a supermarket because they have health issues. People who are donating to bring lunches to people at the hospital. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes me so grateful to live here. You know, that yes, it's hot during the day, but you know, in the morning and, and nights, you can be outside, you can walk. Imagine being in a city where it's all high rise apartments and you know, that situation. So every day I see that in our community and I so appreciate the generosity of our businesses and residents. But you know, I think until you know, we have either a therapeutic cure um, or a vaccine, you know, we're not going to return to our normal life in Palm Springs. Look, this is a social city and it is <laughs> a know. tourist destination and the businesses survive on tourists. And look, you know, there are people who want us to close all tourism until we have a vaccine. And I get that, right? On the other hand, there aren't artificial lines between the cities as far as people going back and forth, um, if we're the only city to do it. And look, our businesses don't survive. We're a city of 48, 49,000 full-time residents with restaurants that no city our size has, with retail no city our size really has, with an international film festival, with a world-class museum. Yep. Those things don't happen in you know, a city in the middle of the you know, Central Valley with 45,000 people. We have an international airport with, 20, you know, with flights to 20 cities nonstop. I mean, we benefit so much from tourism and it's how everything survives. We don't want to see Palm Canyon, all the businesses go out. I mean, that's going to hurt us long-term. So it's balancing that is going to be 
key and really helping the most vulnerable stay safe? Well, with everything that you know you deal with uh, on a daily basis, what 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 keeps you what keeps you up at night? What uh, you know what 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 really sticks and makes you think and doesn't let you sleep sometimes? What is it? Well, other than trying to beat you as I regularly do at work with <laughs> late at night when we're both lying in bed. He's good. He's good. He's good. We have two close games going now, though. It's very, I know. It's great to get to chat with you every night like that as we do that. So it's fun. I mean, it really is, you know, I just got off a of Zoom with a business who's trying to figure out how they possibly survive through this and how they could, you know, expand space, add a kitchen to a different type of restaurant. So be able to work with them and staff to get the right person at the county engaged to pay attention, which we've been pretty successful on. But I worry about those businesses. You know, they've been here 20 plus years and they're not sure they're gonna make it through this. It's, it's you know, terrible. I mean, you think about the people who are surviving on unemployment and the federal government doesn't, wants to cut the benefit while, you know, giving billions to big banks. You know, look at the, the loans that were given, right? All they had to do was look at tax returns. And they know how many employees and they could have cut the checks. But instead, five plus, six plus billion of that went to big Wall Street banks instead of to Main Street, in our case, Palm Canyon, to our small businesses. The fact that cities our size are getting almost no money, right? We, we get $12 per person while Riverside is getting 85 a person and LA is getting 174 per person. No justification for that. Yes, they should get more money, they're bigger, but it should be at the very least the same per person. So we can't do all the programs that other those big cities are getting to do for their residents and businesses. I worry about the people who, how they're going to pay the rent when it comes due, you know, down the road. You know, we've done eviction moratoriums for businesses and re residential, but how are people going to do that? And so, you know, I'm leading an effort statewide to get cities around the state to sign on to a letter to the governor to make up for that difference. You know, our residents should be valued the same as people in Riverside, Long Beach, or LA. They're not worth seven or 15 times more than we are. And it's offensive that that yeah. happened. Right. And so I'm working to really push that at a state level. But that's the stuff that really drives me right now. But it drives me in a positive way. Like, okay, you know, I can sit and whine, right? That's easy. Um, and be frustrated or roll up my sleeves and figure out, okay, stop expecting other people to get things done. Do it yourself. And so I'm not doing it myself. I'm doing it with colleagues at the city. I'm doing it with mayors in other cities around the state. And together, if we all bring our voices together, we can do it. I'm happy to be the one to write the letter. I'm happy to be the one to reach out to my relationships in Sacramento because of my prior work there. You know, whatever I can do to help move this forward, I want to do. And for me, that's rewarding. That's what public service is about. You know, when we got married, we all said, for better or worse, you know, it's good times and bad times. And that's true in government. Look, yeah. we want to help folks. And in this town, um, uh, without yeah. a doubt, everyone helps each other. Right. You know, if someone's got a, a problem, you see a million responses to that sometimes, a million, you know. Uh, and I, I know the feeling of the community yeah. that we have here. And it's special. And it it's, special. it's uh, I know a lot of people have that in their towns too, but ours is, it's really, we are such a family. and. It, we, Everything that affects one does affect the other. Yeah. And, uh, we, uh, but you, you've been doing such, such great, great work uh, on that front. Um, can I ask you a couple topics? You can just give me like your status maybe, or uh, it's about living in Palm Springs. So uh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, you've done a lot of work with the homeless. Where are we at right now with what, you, what you're doing for them? Uh, you know, that, there's a group of 13 cities that gets disproportionate funding, even though they only represent 28% of uh, California, so 13 biggest cities, and that's who got the money again this time. They're all the cities, they're the only cities that got homeless funding last time, but we became the 14th city to get it because we went to Sacramento, we worked with the As Assembly Member Mays, you know, spoke with Governor Newsom about it, and made the case, and we got it through a separate appropriation. Um, and so we're working to get permanent housing, you know, convert a hotel with the county to create permanent housing. Uh, this isn't a shelter, it's permanent housing for people who are homeless. We have six hotels where homeless people have a, a place to stay during this crisis um, right now here in Palm Springs. And, you know, we've had the only shelter in the West Valley. So 
look, if we don't help our most vulnerable people, yeah. you know, I don't know what, what our role in life is. And you know, look, you can't help everyone, not everyone wants help, but the vast majority do. And you know, there is a lack of mental health services in the Valley. You know, fortunately, the old Roy's north of the freeway that was a homeless shelter is going to be opening this fall. Oh, it's just under 100 beds for people as board and care with uh, behavioral health issues uh, with treatment. That's been desperately needed. So, you know, it's an important focus. And I think a lot of other cities don't want anything in their city. Um, and we all have to do our part. We all have to do our part. It's a national crisis. It's huge in California because of our climate. And you know, cities with a downtown like Palm Springs yeah. tend to have um, more homeless people. Uh, but you know, you go look in LA or San Diego, where it's tense everywhere, yeah. and that's not what we want for homeless people. It's not what we want for our residents or our businesses. So, really, being able to maximize and leverage funding to get permanent housing is our top priority. That's awesome. Uh, I know you've done such. Uh... Great work, and I think it's difficult. I mean, you know, you've got so many people uh, out there who need this, and you got a lot of people who are complaining that the city isn't doing it quick enough or, you know, fast enough. And I, I know yeah. it's a process, but yeah. uh, and it's but, not a city function, by the way. Remember that under state law, it's a county function. Uh, so the county gets all the funding, but right. because they gave one homeless mental health crisis team of two people from the entire Coachella Valley. The size of Coachella Valley. So we used our funding and got the Desert Healthcare District to match us to bring two just to Palm Springs. Mm. So we do more than any city in the Coachella Valley, um, even though it's a county responsibility, but they've stepped up recently and I really want to compliment them, especially their staff, um, for their work on this because to partner is how we're going to get this done. Uh, but you know, as soon as it gets mentioned that we're going to convert a hotel to create permanent homeless housing, you know, for families and individuals, and there'll be a restaurant where there'll be job training, uh, not a shelter where people are coming in and out back and forth. Every, the business, a lot of businesses and residents in the area, this is a terrible place for it. Put it out in the middle of the desert. So they want us to fix it, but they don't want us to fix it if it's near them. Yeah. And to the credit, I've had a, a lot of businesses say, we're fine with it near us. Um, but that's good. That's good. My, my view is it should be, if I'm good with it, a block or two from my house, I'll vote for it wherever it is. And I am. You know, if these are run right and people see these facilities, you know, there's Delancey Street in San Francisco, which is this kind of thing, but for people who just got out of prison. And so many people are like, oh, and it's the most successful program. It's been there 20 years. You know, they run a kitchen, they do job training, they now have a moving company to get people trained and jobs. And, you know, to, to let someone out of prison without money, without a place to live and without a job, you shouldn't be surprised they end up back in prison. How are they supposed to survive? Exactly, you know. Uh, right? Yeah, well, uh, good luck on, continued yeah. luck on that because well, I think it's an important issue that is. everyone faces, uh, and especially here in, in Palm Springs. Yeah. What can you uh, tell me about the arena? What's your uh, take on, where are we at with that? Is there anything you can talk about or is everything just on hold or? You know, this is a project with the, you know, tribe and an outside entity on tribal land. So we don't have very much say on it. Um, but, you know, they did announce it's on hold, given, you know, what's going on and the fencing and signs were all taken down uh, from the site. So whether it comes back or not, we don't, you know, we'll just wait and see. But you can even see even the cultural center and the spa, which were mostly built on the outside, have stopped, right? The one project the tribe's focused on is getting the casino and cathedral city open. Because, right. you know, look, the tribe funds these through their own revenue. And without revenue, you know, they have to focus on what's going to bring in funds, but they're committed to completing the spa and the cultural center hopefully next year. But they've had it, they couldn't do all of them at the same time given what happened. There's a, they're all beautiful projects. Yeah. You know, uh, they've done a great job. It's like we have a lot of half or third started projects in town, which makes it a little, uh, uh, it's not the most attractive thing, but you know, it's, it's what can you do right now? Right. Uh, no, I mean, and you know, they, 
given they don't finance the way most private folks do. Um, you know, they've been able to keep some of theirs going, but I'm glad the outsides of those buildings got done before this happened because they're beautiful. And yeah. they're gonna be such great assets for the city. You know, the cultural center is, can be unique in the country and that they're investing that kind of money into that right in our downtown is gonna be amazing. Well, and they're beautifully designed. They've done such beautiful projects. It is, and but you know, it's we, we have no idea when that's, you know, gonna. No, be they're they're saying they're planning on next year once the casino is open in Cathedral City, uh, but you know, obviously everyone is in a financial challenging time right now. Everybody will be in a rebuilding phase for a while, yeah. and um, you know, hopefully everyone, like you were just saying, has a place to stay. Right. Everyone can feel safe uh, here in Palm Springs. And uh, it's, a, it's a big job. And I, I really commend you and the council and everything for all you do. I know that you can't always get the kudos that you deserve. And people are easy, you know, it's easy to sling the arrows at people who are fighting the fight. And maybe it's not getting the results some people uh, want, or it's not fast enough. But uh, you guys and ladies, you all do great work. Oh, and thanks. I'm so glad that you're uh, all there for us. Uh, how long are you mayor for? How does this work? Um, till December. And then, and then we get a new mayor. Yes, like almost all the cities in California. Um, you know, only five cities in California is the mayor, the CEO, right? So people are used to San Francisco or LA or New York or Chicago where the mayor actually isn't on the city council. Oh. That's only true in five cities in California. So where the mayor's, you know, vetoing, signing, a so-called strong mayor. Um, you know, I'm doing all the same work I did before. You know, I'm the tourism liaison, business, homelessness and affordable housing, um, you know, uh, the green energy work. I'll be doing the same stuff next year. I think this year the mayor is especially visible because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, and you chair the meetings. Um, but other than that, we're all equal. And it's important that, you know, not everyone understands that. Um, Cause I've seen things where people are like, well, the mayor could just close down everything. I'm like, I actually can't. I did get called the special meetings. You get to do that when we did close down before the state. Right. Uh, because look, our population due to age and other reasons, um, you know, 50% are in vulnerable groups and we needed to get people's attention that they had to, you know, be safer than they were. And I think our residents responded very well to that. It's, it's a lot of responsibility, I think, put on, you know, to, like you said, to be putting it all onto one person when, like you said, it's, it's done through the county and those decisions are made on different levels, but uh, people just love screaming about, about things and-, uh, and They're and, passionate. Yeah, I'm of course. You know, look, of I don't mind. If people are not mean-spirited and they're passionate about what they are thinking, that's great. I, I agree with that. It, it, it's the way in which it's presented. With, you right. know, yeah. Nine times out of 10. All right, after all of this, what does Mayor Coors do to relax? What, what is your getting, what is your unplug? I'm gonna go do this, even if it's for 10 minutes. Like, what do you do? Uh, I would say in normal times, yeah. uh, you know, James and I took up tennis about two years ago, which we're really enjoying. And you know, we can still do now again which is really nice. Um, you know, the long walks, which you can do morning and night with uh, Dash, our four-year-old adorable, but stubborn puppy. Um, <laughs> her and I have, a, you know, two good uh, ball throwing day, times a day, which is really, really nice. Uh, and, you know, we try and find time every night to watch something, to watch a movie. You know, you know we were still on, I think, episode four, season one of 24. We were so far behind on TV for about a decade. So we're catching up on, on shows now. And you know, cooking has turned out to be a really enjoyable, relaxing, fun thing, which you know, I used to do, but you know, well, you once, I was out of, once I was out of school and working crazy hours, that sort of fell off the plate. We've, we've all been forced to do uh, things that we wouldn't normally just pick to do because we're doing something else. Right. Oh, uh, I, I, I get that. Uh, I, uh, I continue to just, what else can I do? But there's only so much TV you can watch. And no, absolutely. And there's only so many words with friends you can lose to. Yeah. Uh, and read, you know, I've been reading a lot more too. Yeah, that, that too. 
Well, I really appreciate you taking time and sitting and talking to me and to anyone what? who's listening to this. Uh, I want to thank you again for also being so approachable uh, in our community and, and to be a good ear. And I think you communicate really well with everybody uh, right away. I, I mean, I, I see when there's a problem, you know, and we can see it on through Facebook or the other uh, messages with which you use. Uh, and I think it's great. I really want to really commend you. And and the entire council for everything that they're doing. I know it's not an uh, easy job to do. And we all love Palm Springs so much. We do, right. And it, I think we're all passionate about Palm Springs and we would love to see it open again and flourishing. I think we're a little ways away. From it. But uh, so thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Maybe for having we'll, me. We'll, we'll chat again sometime soon, okay? No doubt. And I'll be right. chatting with you tonight, no doubt. Yes, and, uh, I'm sure you friends. Awesome. Thanks for joining everybody. Thanks for uh, listening to Jeff and I and everybody have a great day.